Okay, welcome back after the break. Um, okay, before we went for the break, we looked at, uh, you know, uh, we're looking at kingdom lifestyle or a kingdom living, and we are looking at a few characteristics of a kingdom uh, lifestyle. We looked at holiness and reverence, righteousness, peace and joy, power, authority and dominion, endurance and suffering that uh, are some of the characteristics of kingdom lifestyle. And we saw that if we belong to kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, then we have to have this lifestyle or uh, this kind of living we need to imbibe, we need to make it part of our lives. We need to check ourselves and, uh, you know, where we are missing out and we need to uh, work on those uh, areas and we need to make these characteristics part of our um, lifestyle or our living, okay? Any questions anyone has? Any questions? I hope all of you are in class. Anyone has any questions? Hello, class. Anyone's there? OK, thank you, John. Okay, anyone else? Anyone has any questions? No, okay. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you, success. Okay. Thank you, success. Okay, so we'll move on. We look at uh, some more uh, important aspects of kingdom lifestyle. Um, uh, we look at extending uh, forgiveness, um, which is part of kingdom lifestyle, kingdom living. Uh, you know, we look at Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 to 35. And, um, you know, um, like other parables that Jesus taught, uh, Jesus also began uh, this parable or the story by saying that the kingdom of heaven is like, okay, Matthew 18, 23 to 35. He's talking about another parable and he's, uh, as with other parables, you know, he begins also this parable saying the kingdom of heaven is like a king. Uh, so he says, kingdom of heaven is like, which implies that, uh, you know, this is a, a principle or this is a way of life in the kingdom of God. This is how we need to live in the kingdom of God. This is a principle. This is a way of life that we live in the kingdom of God. Okay. So in this parable in Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 to 35, um, you know, the, the, Jesus says a parable of how, a king wants to settle his accounts and then he sees that, you know, one of his own uh, servants owes him, uh, just say, you know, 10,000 um, uh, bags of gold, okay, or 10,000 rupees uh, or 10,000 bags of gold. So he bring has the servant brought before him and he says, you know, um, you haven't paid your debt. And so he says, give me some more time. And, uh, you know, uh, the king says, we're going to sell your children, your wife and everything that you have. And, uh, you know, so that the debt can be uh, repaid. And then, you know, the servant falls on his knees and he begs um, uh, the king to have patience. And so the king takes pity on him and not only gives him time, but, you know, doesn't give him time. But he says, you know, he will cancel all his debts and let him, let him go free. Just imagine how that you know, servant would have felt because he owed the king 10,000 bags of gold, okay? Now, this uh, servant is very happy, maybe running home to tell his wife, and on his way, you know, he sees somebody who's avoiding him, somebody who's not looking at him, somebody who's running in a, a direction, and then he realizes that's one of his servants who just maybe uh, borrowed from him, you know, uh, one bag of gold. You know, he had borrowed 10,000 bags of gold, this man would have borrowed one bag of gold or just say, you know, he would have borrowed uh, compared to this man who borrowed 10,000 rupees, he would have just borrowed 10 rupees or even 100 rupees from him. Okay. And then, you know, he runs behind him, catches him, chokes him in his neck and says, you wicked person, you know, you've not paid my money back. Give it to me right now. You know, um, 
And this poor servant you know, falls on his knees and says, you know, please have patience with me and I'll pay you back everything that I have borrowed from you. But the servant uh, who the king had forgiven or cancelled his debts, he does not forgive the man who had borrowed from him. He says, you know, I'm not going to, uh, you know, let you go so easily. He ta takes him and has him thrown in the prison. Now, when the other guards and other servants see this, they go back to king and tell him, you know, this is what the servant who you had cancelled the debts, he did to somebody else who just borrowed 10 rupees from him or 100 rupees, which is a meager small amount. You know, and then uh, the king is very angry. He brings this uh, servant back as a servant back brought to him. And he says, you know, you wicked servant, I cancel all your debts uh, because you begged me to. And uh, shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just like I had on um, you? And then, you know, the king has him uh, handed over to the jailers where he is um, uh, thrown into prison where he's tortured till he's able to ba pay back all that he is owed. Okay, And then Jesus ends this parable by saying, this is how your heavenly father will treat each one of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So the principle here is just like God extends his forgiveness to us, we need to extend a forgiveness to others. You know, our uh, our debt that we owe God is something that we can't even repay. It's like this man who can't even repay us 10,000 bags of gold. So our debt that we have that stands before God is something that we just can't pay. Whatever we do our entire lifetime, nothing that we can do can actually repay the debt uh, that we owe God. But, you know, God in his gracious, compassionate mercy and love towards us, he has cancelled everything. You know, he's forgiven us. He's, uh, you know, he's even taken and the Bible says, hurled it into the depths of the sea where, you know, no no one can put a fishing net and even bring it out. And that's that's the amount he loves us. He's, he's forgiven us because our debt is so huge, so great, so big uh, compared to what people do to us. You know, I mean, of course, what people do to us sometimes can hurt, can have a long lasting impression or uh, an impact on our minds, our lives, um, uh, our emotions. Uh, but there's nothing that God cannot heal. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's something that is small compared. It's like what we have done towards God is like 10,000 bags of gold compared to, you know, what our uh, fellow brother or sister does towards us. It's just like, 10 rupees is just a very, very small, meager amount. Nowadays, you don't even get anything in, much in 10 rupees, you know. So, uh, and uh, uh, Jesus is saying when your sins are so great and so big and God has just cancelled it uh, just uh, by a word, um, by his love, he just cancelled everything, you know. It no longer stands. You're free, just imagine. Then shouldn't you extend the same forgiveness to other souls? Here, when we're saying forgiveness, uh, we're not saying that forgiveness uh, does not alter what has happened to us. When we forgive somebody, it does not alter what has happened to us. But uh, forgiveness actually releases us from having any grudge against that uh, person. And that, I think, is what God is more concerned about. Because when there's unforgiveness, it leads to hatred, bitterness, jealousy, to the point of even um, you know murdering that person. Uh, whether in words or deeds or in the physical act, and that is sin, grievous sin before uh, God. So he's saying, you no know, forgiveness, forgiveness actually releases us from the grudge against that person. So when we're forgiving others, it's actually doing us a great deal of good, you know, and not harm because it's we're not no longer having that grudge that uh, we're not no longer upset. It's not depressing us. It's not affecting our health. And Jesus is saying that is forgiveness. And Jesus said, this is a part of the kingdom. Forgiveness is part of the kingdom of uh, God. So if, um, you know, we can look back in our lives and see if we're holding any grudges, bitterness, hatred against um, anyone, it's nothing compared to, you know, the extent that God has forgiven us. So we can go on our knees and say, God, you know, my uh, sins are so great, um, uh, so big, so huge, I can never even repay that. You've forgiven me, help me to extend forgiveness to uh, others so that I can really 
uh, inherit your kingdom. Uh, I can really, you know, be a kingdom a citizen and king, live a kingdom lifestyle. Another important characteristic of kingdom living is uh, stewardship. And here again, uh, we look at another parable uh, in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. Um, like the other parables, which I just said, uh, Jesus again begins this parable uh, with the phrase, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like. And then he goes on to say what it is like. So uh, it's implying that uh, this is a principle or a way of life in the kingdom of uh, God. And so, you know, it's talking about um, uh, a king uh, who goes on a journey and then, you know, he gives, um, uh, you know, a certain amount of uh, uh, money, you know, five talents um, and um, uh, two or uh, uh, talents and one talent. And he goes away and uh, he expects uh, you know, those he has given this amount to, to put into uh, good use uh, and to, you know, reap the benefits of that. So when uh, he comes back, you know, the king wants to settle the accounts uh, with uh, who he has given, uh, you know, entrusted his talents to, his money to. And so he calls the first one and the first one says, you know, you have uh, given me five talents and I've made it uh, into ten talents. And he says, you know, uh, well done, um, you know, and he tells a person, I will make you ruler of many things. He says, enter into the joy of your uh, Lord. And then he goes on to the person who has two talents and he also has multiplied it double and he says the same thing to him. And one person, the person with one talent uh, comes and says, you know, that um, uh, I know you are, uh, you know, a, a, a king, I know that you're a hard man who reaps where you've not sown and gathers where you've not scattered the seed. So I was afraid. I went and hid this talent in the ground. And look, take, this is what you had given to me. It belongs to you. Take it back. And uh, what was the reply of the king, you know, uh, uh, and uh, or his lord? He says, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I've not sown or gather where I've not scattered seed. And he says, at least you could have deposited my money with the bankers so that when I come, I would have received it back with interest. And then he does something. He takes away that talent that he's given, that one talent he's given to that person, that steward, and he gives it to the one who has, um, where he had given five, who had multiplied it for five more, which has become 10 talents. He gives it to that steward. And, um, uh, you know, the, Jesus says, to everyone who has more, more will be given. He will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And then he says, cast this, uh, you know, wicked, lazy a steward or servant into uh, the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the parable of talents, uh, you know, reveals to us the importance of uh, stewardship in the kingdom of uh, God, okay? Uh, God expects us uh, to be good stewards uh, of uh, the time, uh, the resources, the opportunities, the connections, the revelations, uh, and the contacts that he has placed in our life. So God has given us time, talent, opportunities, uh, connections, uh, he's given us revelations from his word and uh, contacts of people that we can contact so that, uh, you know, uh, that he has put in our lives um, uh, so that, you know, we can uh, we can multiply what he has uh, given to us. And um, here we see that, uh, you know, it's important to note that it's not how much he has given us. OK, so we don't look at each other and compare. Oh, you got five, I've got only three or two or one, uh, you know, uh, it's not how much God has given us that he's going to ask, but he's more interested about what we are doing with what he has given us, okay? And we see that, you know, God requires of us uh, to be productive, uh, to be profitable, to multiply, to be fruitful, and then increase what he has entrusted uh, to us. And, uh, you know, simply giving back what God has given to us, uh, which is the example of that man, the one talent, is something that uh, God is uh, not looking for. He doesn't want us to do that. It's something that is unacceptable in his sight. Uh, it's not something that he wants. It's insufficient. Uh, and, you know, uh, he requires us to invest uh, effort 
uh, to sacrifice, to be diligent, to be endure, uh, to have endurance, to use wisdom, uh, you know, to persevere, uh, to work hard, to be committed and sincere um, uh, to the gifts, the assignments, the talents, the opportunities, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the resources that he has placed in our lives. And he is looking for us to bear fruit. And this is what will please his heart. Okay, when he comes again, this is what will please his heart. So uh, this is kingdom stewardship. And, uh, you know, as kingdom citizens, um, kingdom living requires kingdom uh, stewardship. So not only with the talents that God has given us, but even the time that God has uh, placed in our lives, the opportunities that he's given to us, the connections that he's given to us, the revelations of his word that he's given to us, the contacts of people that he's placed in our lives. All of that, you know, requires us to be good stewards of what he has entrusted or placed in our lives. So kingdom living requires kingdom stewardship. So being a good steward, uh, uh, you know, we need to be a good steward of time. We need to redeem our time. Uh, so we need to see how we are spending our time, what we are uh, indulging in, um, how we are making use of our time. Uh, because we know that time does not come free. Uh, but what we do with it, you know, uh, determines whether we are a good steward of it or uh, not. So it's important for us uh, to be, um, you know, good stewards of the talents and the gifts that God has given you. So the question here is, you know, uh, do you know what talents God has given you? Do you know uh, the connections, the, uh, you know, the, the opportunities that he has placed in your life? Are you, and the time that he's given to you, are you maximizing it? Are you using it, uh, investing uh, uh, in all of those things so that it can be productive, so that it can be fruitful? And, um, you know, and uh, are you being a good steward of everything that God has entrusted to you, uh, even time that he has given to you? Are you just wasting away your time uh, indulging in things that really don't matter or does not really edify, build you up, build up your faith or edifies or builds the kingdom of God or extends his kingdom here on earth. So something that we need to look uh, at, be aware of, take stock of and uh, work on. Another important characteristic of kingdom living is no partiality. Um, and uh, we read in James chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, you know, um, you know, in a church setting or a, uh, in um, uh, or in a Bible study or group, you know, if uh, a man comes to our assembly or to our group or uh, to a Bible study or a worship time or a church service, you know, and he's dressed in, in fine clothes and... Um, uh, you know, he smells good and uh, he has uh, gold rings on his finger. Uh, James chapter 2 verse 2 says that. And, you know, we pay attention at the same time along with him, behind him, uh, comes a man who is, uh, you know, looks very poor, does not smell good, not wearing great, uh, you know, polished shoes, uh, maybe just some flat chapels or footwear and, uh, you know, his clothes are not very clean or uh, uh, branded clothes. You know, uh, and he just comes in there and, uh, you know, who do we pay attention to? You know, we pay attention to the one who's wearing fine clothes, smells good, you know, wearing a lot of gold rings on his finger. And we, we give him seat of, uh, you know, importance right up in the front and uh, a good place. Um, but we tell the poor man, you know, we put him somewhere at the back, somewhere in the side or, sorry, we tell him, okay, you know, uh, why don't you just sit down here because there's no place on the chairs you know uh, so james is saying when we do that don't we show partiality among ourselves uh and not just partiality are we not judging and then when we're judging we're judging with evil uh thoughts and he ends in in verse 5 of chapter 2 he says has not god chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and has the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him so what do we learn from this? We learn that, you know, true kingdom living uh, is uh, has a heart that embraces all people across all races, languages, cultures, class, uh, or social barriers. So, you know, just embracing everyone, irrespective of their culture, irrespective of uh, how they dress, they, how they smell, you know, how they look. Uh, 
Um, so we just embrace all of them. So it's a kingdom living is a heart that embraces people across all races, languages, cultures, uh, social barriers or class. So in the kingdom of God, you know, we look at for people or we perceive people, we think of people or we judge people uh, as hairs together in the kingdom of God. We don't look at them at this the social standing, the social status, their wealth, the way they look, but we are actually looking at each one of them, you know, as heirs of the kingdom of God, because all of us are heirs of the kingdom of God. All of us belong to the kingdom of God, and so we are sons and daughters, and we are heirs of the kingdom of God. So all of us come on the right standing, because we are all heirs in the kingdom of God. So hence, we should not do anything out of... Um, Partiality. We need to reach out, uh, uh, talk, um, you know, be friends with both the poor, the rich, the educated, the uneducated, those who have a high social standing, those who have a low social standing, and uh, we need to treat everyone the same without partiality because we're all heirs of the kingdom of God. We're all children of the kingdom of God. That is our standing, not our wealth, our social status, uh, how we look, uh, you know, um, how educated we are, the degrees that we have. That's not but uh, our standing. That's not what we criteria we judge with. The world does that, not us. But we look at everyone as heirs of the kingdom of God. So we need to see um, the king. Uh, we need to see kingdom value in each person. And each one of them have heirs of the kingdom of God, and we need to um, give them the honor that is due to them. It's true that the word of God says, you know, that uh, uh, we honor those who, uh, to, we give special honor to those who honor is due. Uh, we hold them in high regard, uh, those who serve the Lord, who labor um, uh, for the Lord, who minister for the Lord, minister for the word, those who have a spiritual oversight in our lives. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 13 says that we honor them above the rest. Uh, uh, but yet in the way we do things, uh, you know, we do things without partiality. Uh, we don't give preferential treatment based on um, earthly criteria, which is wealth, social standing, or even gender, or uh, we don't give partiality because people belong to our region, our geographical area, our language, our people group, but we treat everyone because they're the same, uh, because each one of them, uh, we perceive them as heirs together in the kingdom of uh, God. And um, that is what we read in First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, where it says we don't show per, uh, partiality or a preferential treatment based on wealth, social standing, or even gender, okay? So we'll move on. Um, another characteristic of kingdom living is uh, being ready for uh, the king. Just two more, uh, being ready for the king and celibate uh, lifestyle. Uh, in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 to 13, again, uh, uh, you know, there's a parable that Jesus says, and again, he starts it off as saying, it's a kingdom of heaven is like, you know, 10 virgins. So he says, this is the principle of the way of life in the kingdom of God. Now we know this um, parable very well, 10 virgins, so waiting for the bridegroom to come. The bridegroom is delayed, so they, you know, kind of trim out their uh, lamps and uh, they fall asleep because it's very late in the night. And suddenly they heard the noise of the bridegroom coming and then they trim uh, back their uh, lambs and, um, you know, uh, five of them, which they, the, this parable causes the foolish virgins, they realize that they're running out of oil. And five of them uh, who this, uh, this parable refers to as, a, uh, as wise ones, wise virgins are ones who bring extra oil. So the foolish ones ask the wise one to share a little oil and the wise being wise saying, you know, if we share this oil with you, then we will not have enough uh, for you and for ourselves as well. So why don't you run, you know, go close by and see if there's any shop where you can buy oil. So these five foolish ones, they, you know, uh, uh, virgins run off and uh, to look for oil. In the meantime, the bridegroom comes and the five wise virgins, they follow the uh, bridegroom, they enter into the uh, wedding banquet and the door is closed. And, you know, the so-called foolish virgins, when they come, they knock on the door, you know, uh, they're not allowed because, uh, you know, the, the reply from the other side is that we do not know who you are. So, um, 
the Lord Jesus, what do we learn from this parable? Uh, the Lord Jesus, you know, when he gave us this parable of the kingdom of heaven, uh, it was uh, basically teach us how to live uh, in a constant state of readiness uh, for the second coming of the king or the king's uh, return. Uh, so not only does this, this parable say that we need to have sufficient oil uh, for our lamps to be burning, but we need to also have uh, uh, enough reserve to keep our lamps burning until he comes. Okay, So we need to ensure that we have enough reserves uh, to keep our lamp burning. Uh, so what do we mean by this? Now, um, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, one way of applying this parable is to understand uh, that our lives uh, and our works are uh, our lamps that is giving out light. You know, we are the light of the world. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 14. Okay. And um, uh, our light is uh, our good deeds, our good works, works of holiness that we just referred to, we saw in point one, holiness and, um, uh, you know, uh, humble and uh, referential living, okay? So our good works, the ministry, the things that we do uh, for the sake of God, for his kingdom to represent him here on earth, uh, is the way people see his light shining, uh, uh, you know, uh, before them. So we are the light of the world. What does it mean? That means uh, the way we think, the way we act, react, the lifestyle, the way we speak, um, you know, the things that we do, uh, everything is, uh, you know, it's in its accordance with kingdom lifestyle, uh, with the kingdom of God, with what God requires of us will be like a light shining in this dark world and our lives will represent Jesus Christ, will represent his kingdom here on earth, will manifest his uh, glory and, uh, and through our lives, you know, the kingdom power will be demonstrated, will be manifested and will bring glory to God. Um, uh, and to glorify our Father who is in heaven, as we read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. But we must ensure that we continue to live uh, and be a light uh, in the way we live, the way we conduct our lives, uh, uh, the way we do ministry till Jesus comes. Uh, now, to make this happen, we need to have an ongoing supply of oil. Now, Oil in uh, scriptures uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, is um, uh, symbolizes uh, God's life. It also symbolizes the presence, anointing, and the working of the Holy Spirit. So, uh, oil uh, along with dove water, um, uh, dove water, oil are all symbols of the Holy Spirit, or it's like. Uh, the, you know, we understand the, the work, the person and work of the Holy Spirit through these uh, symbols. Okay, so oil is basically referring to God's life, his presence, the, anoint, the presence and anointing and the working of the Holy Spirit. Um, so, um, uh, you know, uh, without the Holy Spirit in our lives, without the anointing, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, you know, we cannot uh, live our lives daily. Uh, we cannot go through our lives daily and we cannot, uh, you know, uh, 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 be sanctified and uh, our lives will not be able to reflect the salvation of God um, to good deeds um, because we do not, you know, have the power and the working and anointing of the Holy Spirit uh, in our lives. So we must ensure that each day we are, you know, in intimacy with in fellowship with the Holy Spirit so that we will experience a continuing supply of uh, uh, of this oil, which is uh, the life of God, the presence, the power, the anointing, and the working of the Holy Spirit uh, in our life. So how can we do this? Um, you know, it's basically abiding in Christ, abiding in Jesus Christ, abiding in the Holy Spirit. It's constantly being connected in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, through prayer, uh, through reading God's word, meditating on God's word, obedience, and uh, intimacy. That way, you know, we are always connected in our heart to uh, God, okay? Um, so without this intimacy, 
you know, we cannot live our lives here. Uh, we would be like the uh, five virgins uh, who did not have their lamps burning uh, while the, when the king comes and, you know, the king will say, I do not know who you are. So kingdom living basically calls for a lifestyle of constant intimacy with God, uh, where we are living our lives um, uh, and, you know, our ministry shining our lights for Jesus in the way that we live, uh, in the way that we behave and, uh, you know, act and think. And this is, uh, you know, comes when we are connected uh, with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're constantly in intimacy with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The last uh, characteristic of uh, that we will be looking at, it's not in the last, in terms of last, there's no more, but there are more we can add to this, but something that we will look at lastly in this chapter is being celibate for the kingdom's sake. In Matthew chapter 19, uh, verses 9 to 12, uh, you know, um, he talks about, um, uh, you know, in verse 12, for there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. So he who is able to accept it, let him accept it. Okay. So in the context of, um, of divorce, sexual immorality, um, and all that, you know, uh, Jesus mentions this in verse 12. Now, the term eunuch here is um, uh, used here in the context of uh, not marrying, okay, uh, being single, being celibate, uh, practicing celibacy. And it's not uh, like the, the term that we understand eunuchs as, you know, somebody who's going through, uh, uh, undergoing some physical change. Uh, that we commonly understand, okay? So uh, this verse in verse 12 says, there are those who were born to be celibate, okay? Uh, which means that, you know, they have no inclination, they have no desire whatsoever for marriage. Then secondly, there are those who are, uh, you know, are made celibate by man. They're forced into being uh, single because of uh, social, religious or other influences that have compelled them to take on uh, celibacy. Um, okay, maybe social uh, reasons, maybe religious reasons, maybe other things uh, that has happened to them which is compelling them not to marry to be celibate okay and then there are those who choose a celibate lifestyle for the sake of the kingdom of heaven some people don't want to marry so that they can invest all of their time effort energy uh, you know into um, you know uh, building god's kingdom extending god's kingdom here on Earth. So Apostle Paul is an example of uh, the last, uh, you know, a choice that is choosing to be a celibate or choosing to be a eunuch in this in this case, when we're talking about eunuch, is talking about those who are choosing a celibate lifestyle uh, because he wanted to further the kingdom of um, heaven. Okay, so Paul knew that he had a right, he had a legitimate, legitimate right to take a believing wife, to have a believing wife, but yet he chooses uh, to forego this uh, for the sake of preaching the gospel. And we read this about this in First Corinthians 9, um, in chapter 9, verse 5 and verses 15 to 16. And also he says that uh, he that he's made this choice so that you know, he could serve the Lord without any distraction, which he mentions in uh, chapter 1 of, uh, sorry, in uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 35. So, you know, um, you can choose if you want to be married. It really doesn't matter. You can still marry and, you know, live kingdom culture, kingdom lifestyle, kingdom thinking. You can release the power of the kingdom of God that is in you, uh, to, you know, in your marriage, to your children, uh, and also to the sphere of influence that God has um, uh, placed you in. Or, you know, you can choose, um, you know, to give up marrying so that you can, um, you know, you can serve God better. You will not be distracted. Uh, that's a choice that is left up to you. And that is also leading of the Holy Spirit, what he's leading and asking you to so in this chapter, we basically saw about um, kingdom lifestyle, characteristics of kingdom lifestyle. So the importance that uh, of holiness and reverence uh, 
uh, which is um, and um, uh, you know which is a translation of the salvation that we have received if you've received salvation you know it translates into good works uh, the sanctification that is happening is shown through the way that we live holiness and if we indulge in the uh, deeds of the flesh you know it uh, proves to us that uh, you know we have no place in the kingdom of heaven that we are unrighteous and um, we cannot inherit the kingdom of god and uh, you know sometimes we give up our legitimate rights as we saw uh, so that we don't become a hindrance to others who believe uh, but we pursue righteousness peace and um, joy um, and in the kingdom of God we go through endurance and suffering which is part of the kingdom uh, son which God has promised us along with the promise that we will be children of God heirs of God the promise also that is we will go through suffering uh, and we have to endure suffering we have to be patient um, and uh, forgiveness you know when, uh, when God has forgiven us our debts is so huge so big something that we can't comprehend, something that we can't just simply pay back, then, you know, we when we think about that, it's easy for us to forgive somebody who has done something very small compared to what uh, our sins are so great in the sight of God. Then we don't show partiality. Uh, we are ready for the coming of the King. And, you know, uh, when we live this, this kingdom lifestyle, you know, uh, we are mindful of uh, who we are, uh, you know that we are called where we are called to which kingdom we are called to and when we are mindful and we live like this the power and the authority of the dominion of god that is in us vested in us will uh, be released and we will see ourselves dominating our challenges and situations that overwhelm us whatever it is we will speak to those things and we will also flow in mighty signs miracles and um, wonders okay so that is um, chapter 5 about kingdom uh, living any questions any questions on king uh, on uh, chapter 5 no questions So I hope uh, we're not just going to be, uh, you know, all of us, including me, not just going to be hearing or learning these things, but, uh, you know, it's important why we're doing this course is because we belong to the kingdom of God and we need to change our kingdom thinking, perspectives, mindsets. Um, we also need to change our uh, lifestyle. And, uh, and we will look now at uh, Chapter 6, Kingdom Culture, and why it's important for us to live kingdom thinking and kingdom lifestyle how it's going to influence the culture okay if there's no questions can we move on to chapter six okay okay we'll move on to chapter six um thank you subhashis roslin and lubega thank you anita okay uh, according to, um, thank you, success, Revelation chapter 1, verses uh, 5 to 6, we see that as believers, you know, we've been washed from our sins by the blood of Jesus, and he has made us priests and kings of our God. So can somebody please read Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, please, for us? Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Anyone? Revelation chapter one was five. Revelation chapter one. I thought Rosalind, you are reading. Let me read. Go ahead, Rebecca. Chapter one, verse five and six. It says in King, New King James Version, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the first born from the dead and the ruler over the kings of earth to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and he made us kings and and priests to his god and father to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever amen 
Thank you, Lubega. So here we see in this uh, two verses, there's a present tense application of us being kings and priests to our God. In the present, as kings, we uh, represent God's rule. We represent God's reign here on earth. We've already learned about that. We're here to see and further his kingdom, uh, you know, into our realm, into our earthly realm. So as priests, we glorify our God. Okay, and how do we glorify our God? Uh, uh, when we worship him. Uh, we also glorify God when we take the matters of uh, the earth to heaven, when we intercede, when we pray, and when we seek God's heart to bring, uh, you know, heaven here on earth or to interfere, uh, to bring heavenly inter uh, intervention, sorry, to bring heavenly intervention uh, in the affairs of uh, the life here on earth. So there is also we see there is a, a future tense, just like we saw there's a present tense um, where, you know, we are here to bring his kingdom here into our earthly realm uh, by bringing heavenly intervention of the affairs of, uh, of his life, of uh, the heavenly life, the kingdom culture, the kingdom reign, rule, uh, kingdom presence here on earth. That is a present tense application. In this verse, we also see there's a future tense application of being kings, and priests when we will reign on the earth in his literal kingdom okay which we read in revelation chapter 5 verses 9 to uh, 10 so we also said this in the in chapter 1 we are basically now part of a spiritual kingdom we will also be part of a natural kingdom when jesus comes again the second time uh, you know and then we will all reign on this earth in his a literal kingdom so you know in first peter chapter 2 verse 9 we read that uh, you know we are a royal priesthood uh, a holy nation a people belonging uh, to god a people who've come out from darkness into uh, his marvelous light so as royal priesthood uh, you know we are kingly priests you know or we are kings and priests uh, we are a holy nation uh, Lubega, can you please um, uh, mute your mic? Thank you, Lubega. Okay. Um, so, you know, um, uh, First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, We are a royal priesthood, we are kingly priests, or we are kings and priests, we belong to a holy nation and the word nation here is the greek word ethnos which means uh, a race or a tribe so you know as a nation uh, or a tribe of people uh, you know uh, we have same habits same customs same culture because we belong to a specific kingdom and so belonging to the kingdom of god all of us you know have the need to have the same habits, customs, and cultures because we belong to the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. So as kings and priests, we are people of a common kingdom culture. You know, we have a set of shared attitudes, values, goals, uh, and uh, practices that characterize us that uh, we belong to the kingdom of uh, God. <laughs> okay, no problem, Rubeka. Okay, and uh, you know, we share a common set of beliefs and uh, behavior, okay? Um, and as a community of uh, believers, you know, we, uh, even as we belong to this kingdom culture, we need to follow kingdom thinking and kingdom living. And when we follow kingdom thinking and kingdom living, which is, uh, you know, attitudes, values, goals, uh, practices, beliefs, and behaviors of the kingdom of heaven, we actually create a kingdom culture. Now, we're, we're kind of incorporating what we learned about kingdom thinking and kingdom living and looking at the importance of why we need to king, think like kingdom citizens and live our lifestyles as kingdom uh, citizens, because when we do that, you know, we are actually coming together. Uh, we are all sharing the same attitudes, values, practices, beliefs, and behaviors, and we are creating a kingdom culture in our in our in our environment, or we'll, uh, you know, in this the world that we are living in, which is a foreign territory because we don't belong here. So we need to establish such a culture. 
you know, we need to establish such a culture amongst us as a community of believers where we are truly functioning as kings, as priests of the kingdom. Okay, kings means we exercise dominion, authority, we subdue, uh, we exercise our authority as priests. You know, uh, we worship God. We 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 looked at it in in chapter two. You know, uh, we uh, we pray and ask Him to, uh, you know, decree and. Uh, bring about his kingdom culture here we pray we intercede uh, for um, you know heavenly uh, intervention in our earthly life uh, and uh, we also offer sacrifices to god uh, not just through our lips but to our very lives the way that we live a kingdom lifestyle and as believers we also need to understand that kingdom teaching um, uh, you know, understand kingdom teaching, we need to understand kingdom teaching and we need to begin to think and live from a kingdom perspective. So uh, these are the two things that we need to do to establish a culture amongst us as a community of believers where we truly function as kings and priests of the kingdom and uh, as believers we understand kingdom teaching and begin to think uh, and live from kingdom perspective so when we uh, we as believers follow kingdom thinking we as uh, believers live the kingdom lifestyle then we create a kingdom culture in our environment so when such a community is established you know it will be such a powerful uh, community that is you know coming against the uh, the gates of hell coming against the forces of darkness and it prevails the forces um, that are coming against us advancing against the kingdom of god and then we will truly be salt and light in this world so why is it important for us to create a kingdom culture is because um, uh, a kingdom culture community will you know, it become uh, a prevailing force uh, for advancing the kingdom of God. We will advance the kingdom of God uh, with great force because there's unity, there's oneness, we're coming together. Uh, the second thing, like I mentioned, is that we will truly be salt and light in this world. Uh, for this is what God has called us to be. Uh, and also the third thing is that kingdom culture will overpower overthrow the evils of any culture around us so we dominate the culture we will uh, dominate the situations the world view the things that are around us and when people come into a kingdom culture environment they're coming uh, with you know with their own baggages they're bringing with them their evils of their own existing culture then you know it will bring about change in their life it will not change us uh, who are creating this kingdom culture the only thing that will change is a culture which they have walked in the evil culture which they have walked in you know they will be delivered from that they will be set free from that okay so we look at a few facets of kingdom culture uh, uh, just a few process of kingdom culture the first one is a culture of honor okay uh, kingdom we've already looked at it in the previous lesson but kingdom culture is a culture where we practice giving honor reverence and respect to everyone irrespective of their social standing well status because all of us are heirs of the kingdom so when you honor someone you're basically expressing the value you place on them who they are and what they mean to you personally so we need to honor everybody in the kingdom of god because what is their value each one of them are hairs in the kingdom of god irrespective of whether they're educated or uneducated okay so when do we show honor to someone uh, we give honor with uh, what we say and what we do when we speak highly of them uh, when we refuse to defame them gossip or backstab them uh, when we stand in the presence of that person, applaud them, or give financially into their life when they are in need, or serve them in any way when they are in need, uh, you know, we show uh, honor to that person. Okay. We'll continue with this lesson in the next class. We'll stop here. We just have one minute. Anyone has any questions? Anyone has any questions? Okay. No questions? 
Okay, then we'll end class. Thank you all uh, for joining class today. Uh, I hope you were benefited by what you learned, and I hope you would uh, it will translate into the way that we live and think. And we will take stock of what we have learned and listened, and uh, you know we will um, truly live kingdom lifestyle and think in the kingdom mindset. Okay, okay. Thank you all, and have a, a blessed week ahead. God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Sidikenu.